Dodgers. Um, mm. And the absolute art piece uh, picture that I saw from uh, batting practice with Mookie and Shohei standing next to each other. Of course, they don't put first names on the back of jerseys. You know, Tony Betts. It's a, uh, <laughs> it's a, it's perfect. We all feel bad for uh, your mid-market, small market uh, Los Angeles Dodgers and hope that they can somehow uh, figure out how to win some games this year with that tiny I budget. Have some, yeah, I have some confidence that they'll be able to make it happen with that, uh, with that payroll. Yeah, um, for sure, for sure. All right, Jacob, let's get into uh, Florida Gators. Uh, let's talk a little basketball. We haven't gotten to, uh, to basketball yet on this show. Gators lose a heartbreaker to Colorado in a game that uh, – the referee, um, the head referee, did not get asked to referee on Sunday, surprisingly. Uh, mm-hmm. But the Gators did lose in a game that featured very little defense. It looked like Todd Grantham's defense uh, out there. Jacob, what uh, talk us through what was otherwise a, a very happy season for Florida Gators basketball ends in uh, a little bit of disappointment. But uh, give us kind of the breakdown of, of that game and, and just the basketball program at large. Yeah, well, look, I, I think it's worth mentioning, at least to start, that that was going to be a really hard game for Florida to win. And I think that that was the case before some questionable refereeing, especially towards the end of the contest. Uh, once Florida lost Micah Hamlockton, this was going to be a real challenge. Colorado is a very effective scoring team, especially inside. They do a really good job with their defensive rebounding. Uh, losing your starting center, who had the second best offensive rebounding season in Florida history, was going to make that really difficult to win. And so there was a reason that Colorado entered play as the favorite. Uh, things played out that way. I believe Colorado finishes a one and a half point favorite on the you know betting and they won by two. So things generally played out how I thought they, they would in that game. I think Florida could have been a lot better with its interior defense. They allowed a lot of dribble penetration to the hoop. Uh, Colorado got away with a lot of scoring around the rim. And then of course, you know, the officiating didn't help with that. Eric Curry, Didn't get advanced to Sunday, like you said. He called Todd Golden for a technical. That was the second time that he's called Todd Golden for a technical, and he has three in his career. Uh, And so that obviously compounded Florida's issues. Uh, And it was kind of just one of those games. You know, Florida Florida wasn't able to get a stop. Uh, The referees seemingly were kind of playing against Florida as well. Uh, And the result was the result. Yeah, and I'm not – How much – real quick. How much – you were were in Nashville. How much – obviously – a from just an on court standpoint and his production as is one thing, but how does just the injury and, and the extent and, and and how gruesome the injury was? How does that just affect the team? And what did you see just mentally um, coming back from that? I mean, in the SEC tournament championship game, when the injury happens, I'm thinking, well, the team's cooked. Like you, can, it's hard to reset mentally and focus on a game, uh, and, and then even to try to then carry that into the NCAA tournament where it's, you know, one and done. Yeah, well, that, that was absolutely the case. And I think that you kind of hit the nail on the head there. It, it seemingly kind of sucked the wind out of the sails for Florida immediately when it happened. You know, I was sitting courtside when Hanlogton got hurt, and you could tell that once Florida's players realized what had happened, and it kind of took a second for everybody to realize just the extent to which he was injured in that game, it, nothing was really the same. Florida's energy was gone. Uh, we saw, especially in that championship game against Auburn, things started to get sloppy really quickly after Hanlogton got hurt. It's because I think everybody's mind was somewhere else. They were wondering how Hanlogton was doing. Uh, I think everybody was truthfully a little bit traumatized with just how violent it was when it happened. Uh, and, and then nothing was quite the same. You know, Florida's energy was still kind of sapped a little bit when we spoke to the team on Tuesday in Gainesville after they had gotten back from Nashville. Uh, and, and I think that it took some time for them to even rebound to like a, we can get back out on the court confidently level. Uh, And I don't know that they even returned fully to the confidence that they had played with all season by the time they got to their tournament game. I mean, think about the situation. Florida didn't know who it was going to play in March Madness until Wednesday when Colorado beat Boise State. So we're talking Mm. about a team that had to prepare late for its opponent. It didn't know who exactly it was going to play. We're talking about a team that had to prepare a rotation and utilize guys in, in manners that they hadn't all year long. So they had to reconfigure roles. They didn't know who they were playing. And they had just seen their teammate go through what I thought was one of the worst injuries in college sports since maybe 2013 when we saw something somewhat similar with Kevin Ware. So uh, mm-hmm. it was a really hard week for Florida. I thought the timing was bad. 
Uh, and, and to your point, you know, mentally, it, it took a toll that I don't think that they had enough time to recover from. What what did happen? I know Todd Golden was aghast, if you will, um, before he got his technical. I, I think I saw Graham Hall or or somebody was tweeting about a broken whistle uh, that nobody could hear. What what did actually happen sideline? Because we just saw Todd Golden pissed and then we saw the T. Yeah, there was a late foul call and, and Eric Curry claimed that he blew his whistle, but the whistle didn't work. And then he signaled over to the scorer's table late that there was a foul that he intended to call. Uh, and Todd Golden just hated it. He did not think that that was fair. Uh, obviously, nobody heard the whistle. And he basically tried to say, you're calling this way after the fact. Uh, mm. You know, what's the deal? And so Eric Curry, to my understanding, told him to get back into the coach's area. He was outside of that zone. Golden told him, I'm back in the area. Eric Curry teed him up at that point. So uh, there was kind of no leash given. It sounds like there's a little bit of a history between Curry and Golden. Uh, and for the third time in, in Golden's career, he was assessed a technical. And uh, two of those three, again, have, have been from Eric Curry. The, the season it's, ended. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, go ahead. The season ended with the injury, uh, one and done in, in the tournament. But overall, uh, how, how would you sum up the season? You know, I, I think that this was a huge season for Florida. I think it was a building block campaign for them. Do I think that it ended the way anybody imagined or wanted? Uh, no. And, and like you said, that goes back to when Hanlogton was hurt. Uh, and obviously the first round exit didn't help with that either. But this is a team that grew from 16 and 17 in its first season under Todd Golden, where they had a litany of issues, be them rebounding or three-point shooting. Uh, both of those things were a major problem in year one to a team that had 21 regular season wins in year two, was one of the highest scoring teams in the nation. I think they were sixth at the time of their loss to Colorado uh, in points per game. They're one of the most efficient offenses in the country. So this was kind of a proof of concept year. We saw Florida go from questionable in its first season under Todd Golden to this is what these guys can be. And, you know, maybe what can it look like going forward? I think Florida still needs to learn how to play better defense under Golden. I think that that's going to be a priority in the portal for them this off season. But the, the key is that they set the foundation for their program. They're going to return the majority of their roster from this past season, this very successful group. And now they're going to be able to build upon it, go back into the portal and go get guys who are starting caliber or high rotation caliber players uh, and, and elevate from a team that is now a 21 win team, 24, if you look at the whole picture uh, and, and see what they can do to grow it. I, I really do think that Florida positioned itself and it doesn't mean that it's going to you know, come to fruition. But at a minimum, Florida positioned itself to be much more successful next year and to potentially even compete for the top of the conference. This was, you know, a, a, an 11-win team in the SEC play. And in most years, that's a top four finish. So uh, Florida's headed in the right direction. I think they emphatically proved that this year. And, and even though they, it didn't end the way that I think people wanted, uh, the, the proof of concept was there nonetheless. Yeah, we talked a little bit about it last week. It's just frustrating that the Gators made it all the way to the SEC championship. They lose. They lose Micah during that time. They still end up a seven seed. It's like you never want them to lose, and you always want to give them the chance to compete. But it's almost like, man, if we just wouldn't have come back against Texas A&M, you know, is Florida still dancing? Because uh, they would have probably still been a seven seed. So frustrating in hindsight to uh, to think about. But uh, yeah, I think Todd has even said that. <laughs> Um, you can correct me because I went to zero Todd Golden press conferences, but um, I think Florida was playing their best basketball late. Um, and you don't want to play your best basketball in October, November. There's no sense in uh, being being a uh, you're the best version of yourself uh, in the first month of the season. So I think that's kind of the frustrating part too. Is um, you, you kind of were peaking at the right time and and then just uh, really unfortunate set of circumstances that just kind of went after another uh, and then the season ends abruptly. Well, you know, I was going to say that I think this season is as promising as it was. And as much as Florida was able to kind of push itself in the right direction under Todd Golden, it will also kind of be defined by its misfortune to some degree. Uh, even we can go back before the season even started. Florida had a commitment from yeah. Yale transfer forward, EJ Jarvis. They were looking at him as somebody who was going to be a factor in its rotation. And for personal reasons, he steps away from basketball. So they start the year down a scholarship player who they were never going to get back. So minus one for Florida right out the gate. And then you have 
Zion Pullen misses the first three games of the season because the NCAA, uh, you know, suspends him for participating. Doing doing NCAA things, yeah. Exactly. Participating in a tournament that lots of guys are participating in, was exploring his draft prospects, and they said, well, you returned, you're suspended. Three games. Uh, Florida loses to Virginia. I would argue if it had Pullen, probably don't lose that game, uh, you know, in neutral site territory. Uh, You go later on in the year, Florida has handlocked him. Uh, suffer a, an ankle injury early on that they had to play three games without him. Later on in the year, obviously, Hanlockton has a massive leg injury that is a you know an emotional drain, but also takes a toll on their rotations. And then you get into the tournament, and they're stifled not only by the fact that they don't have their starting center, but the officiating is questionable so bad that Eric Curry doesn't advance to the second round of the tournament. So this was a season that I think was a lot of progress. Uh, and also a lot of bad luck for Florida that kind of came to define the year overall. Yeah, we and, saw and, a bunch of bad officiating. Um, I spent all weekend watching either uh, Florida LSU or college basketball. Um, I, I wonder, and I think that the uh, advancement of gambling laws, I think we will finally get overdue in at least college football uh, and college basketball full-time officials. There's so much money being wagered and gambled on these games where you have mm-hmm. Learfield marketing executives making calls mm. in March Madness games. And maybe you need to have full-time referees making calls in March Madness games uh, and not people who spend nine months, 10 months out of the year in boardrooms. Well, mm. you, you and I have talked about this off the camera before, Nick. This is a, uh going to become a more prevalent thing. It's easier and easier to gamble. Uh, it's easier and easier to be influenced by external factors. If you're somebody who makes important decisions on the court, be it a mm-hmm. coach or a referee or a player, uh, and that will have to be reformed over time. And, and to be clear, I'm not saying that anybody was influenced by uh, a bet that they had over the weekend, but I do think that it's something that has Take to be done. on. Recording here first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who did Shohei Otani bet on? You know. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> but, but but I do think I, I do think in seriousness that that is something that will have to be monitored yeah. at least to some degree because I think it's going to be hard to avoid that these guys are mm. influenced by these factors that exist outside that are now very accessible and and you know can become a problem. Absolutely. Um, speaking of misfortune, you know, I know a lot of the Gator fan uh, faithful was very excited about Riley Kugel coming back this year. Obviously not the year that, that he probably anticipated Gator fans anticipated. You didn't see much of him towards the end of the season uh, expectation. Well, what kind of happened there? What can you tell us about like what happened? And then uh, you see expectation is probably not to expect him back in the orange blue next year. Is it? All right, well, I'll, I'll address that part first just because I think yeah. the answer is a lot more simple. I, you know, I think that it's yet to be decided. If I was a betting man to keep on the on the theme here, I would say that it's probably more likely that he explores his options in a minimum. I mean, the reality is that this is a guy who was a preseason all-conference pick, and there were several games, including down the stretch, where he was a, did not play due to coach's decision. Mm-hmm. Uh, and those things typically don't lead to let's run it back and try it again. So – you know, I, I'll, I would be surprised uh, if he didn't explore his options. But at the same time, I don't think that that's been determined 100% as the time of us having this conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we'll have to wait and see. But as far as the year went, you know, I think that it was a combination of factors. At times, uh, you know, you don't need me to tell you guys this. I think we all saw it. The attitude and kind of the body language was not necessarily where it needed to be uh, all the time. And, and Todd Golden has said very publicly I value consistent effort, regardless of the minutes that you're playing. It's the reason that we saw Denzel Aberdeen emerge in a very significant role later on in the season, because he was consistent. Denzel Aberdeen is a guy who, if you ask any player or coach on this roster and team, uh, he is a guy who shows out every single time in practice, and he averaged under 10 minutes a game uh, throughout the season. I am not at every practice, so I can't comment on this fully, but you know, I, I would go as far as to assume that Kugel's effort wasn't as consistent. It probably wasn't what Golden was looking for. And when that happens, it leads to guys vaulting you in the depth chart. And, and, you know, we can point right back to Denzel Aberdeen. That was somebody who got some minutes that I think initially would have went towards Riley Kugel. And it just comes down to the effort you put in and and what the coaches are going to be willing to give you back uh, as a result of that. Shout out to the Denzel Aberdeen legacy game uh, in Nashville. 
from a from a roster perspective, how many guys you think we go out there in the uh, in the portal? Well, let's start with we had a couple of people in the chat asking about um, Walter Clayton, and then and you just addressed Riley Kugel as well, right? Well, so yeah, I'll, I'll ask you both questions. I, as far as Walter Clayton goes, my current expectation is that he's back in the fold. Uh, again, like I said with Clayton, I don't know that that's decided at the time of us having this conversation. It's still very fresh after the season ended. Florida was just eliminated, and I think that there are conversations and research that still need to occur. Uh, but if I had to guess right now, I would tell you that Walter Clayton is a Gator again uh, for the 24-25 season. And then as far as the portal goes, it'll depend somewhat on that. So at the time, at this time, I would say the safest thing to say is that there's a range. I would say it's three to five. Uh, I think that Florida could end up going out to Europe, as we've seen it do for two off seasons under Golden, and go get a freshman player uh, from that part of the world who's going to you know, take on a roster spot. They have a commitment and a signature from Isaiah Brown, a, a prospect out of Orlando Christian Prep. Uh, he will play a role next year and will take up a roster spot. If Clayton returns, uh, that limits you, I believe, off the top of my head to five or four roster openings, and those spots will be filled by the portal. I don't really anticipate Florida making any late freshman additions that aren't of the international variety, and that'll leave spots for about four or five uh, transfers. I can imagine that they're going to take either two or three forwards, especially now that they have to account for what could probably be a lengthy recovery for Micah Handlogton. Uh, and of course, they'll need to replace Zion Pullen at that point guard position. So there alone, you have three or four transfers, and it could be as high as five. I know that there was a player from Mount St. Mary's that heard from Florida. Um, Tawan in the chat here is asking about the center from Rutgers and Amari Williams, um, two different players. I don't know if you had heard anything about them or Florida's interest. It's an odd time yeah, for the portal so- to open up right during the middle of March Madness. That's wild. <laughs> Well, so uh, honestly, the answer to that question is is to that point, and it's this. Yeah. Florida actually has not really been aggressively going after players or making you know concerted efforts to re- start to recruit guys because it was still in the season. And Todd Golden, I had a conversation with him in Nashville, and he explicitly told me, we are not focusing on the portal while we're still playing. So my current expectation is that Florida is probably meeting as we are uh, and having a conversation about who it is that they want to pursue and starting to set up those visits. But I can tell you that any contact prior to Florida's elimination from the NCAA tournament was very preliminary. Just let's get our you know name in the hat at that point. It wasn't let's pursue this guy. They haven't made any decisions. Uh, and so I think we start to see that pick up now. But I would you know take every listed contact that you see publicly at this time with a grain of salt, just because I, you know I can tell you with certainty that Florida was slowing down its process so that it could focus on the team that it had, not on next year's group. Hmm. Good stuff. Good stuff. Any more basketball questions, guys, before we get into football here? No, I'm good. I'm good. All right, cool. So football back after a spring break hiatus. Uh, Spring practice on, yes, Saturday? Saturday. 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 And then again today, I presume? Tuesday. Tuesday. Dan, okay. Come on, Dan. Tuesday. I don't Thursday. know. Schedule. I'm not invited to the practices like you guys are. Um, get together, bro. Yeah, Jacob, give me your unpaid uh, intern, your... Dan. We can get it. We can get him on the field. I don't know. After the last couple unpaid months, I don't know intern. if the invite is still extended. Um, all right. So, uh, give us your thoughts, uh, Jacob. Uh, some players that you're looking out for, and then we'll let you run after after that, or some things that you've seen on the on the field, some things that you've heard. Just give the guys some good news or any news. Yeah, you know, I, I still think that it's one of those things where it is the springtime and everything is happy and great uh, in the spring, and it's easy to get kind of carried away with that. I'm sure Nick has said that a million times on the podcast. Nick uh, never gets carried away, actually. Posi vibes. <laughs> no, Nick, Nick's Nick's always never has been. Anything. Always has been. Yeah, I. Uh, but I would say, you know, I, I think that there is a different vibe at practices, and I will agree with Billy Napier here. Uh, Florida's new coaches have kind of set a different tone than what we saw in previous practice sessions, whether that's Gerald Chapman, who you can hear from outside the complex yelling at his players because he's just so, you know, passionate and and motivated to get these guys to play to his image for the group. Uh, Or Will Harris, who we walk in uh, at a gate that is right in front of where the secondary does its individual skill development period. 
And we walk in and almost every single day we see Will Harris holding a pad uh, and getting tackled by his players to help them work on tackling technique. Those were not things that existed uh, previously with this team. And so I, I do think that there's kind of a different energy uh, around practice and having had some conversations with players, you know, Nick has been there for this too. I think that we could agree that there's kind of a different sense of motivation, whether that's born from we've lost and had losing records in la the last two years and now we need to show some progress, or if that's because this is just a, a group that has that extra push uh, from its new coaching staff to be in a position to have that, you know, extra want to uh, in order to really take a step forward as a program. That being said, uh, it's still a little early to have standouts. Remember, Florida had two essentially non-contact practices before spring break, and now we're just getting into the full contact, you know, full swing of spring practices. Uh, but there are some guys standing out. I would say that Aaron Gates is somebody who has really stood out to me. He's looked super athletic uh, and like somebody who I think could contribute as a second-year player after last year kind of dealing with some injuries. Uh, Jakeem Jackson is another cornerback, you know, star – slot corner hybrid type player who's had a really nice looking spring so far at least uh the entire secondary really ha has been impressive and billy napier was willing to say that publicly uh that he thought that unit took a step forward and so uh i would say that that's possible so far but i also don't want to get ahead of myself and i'll say this you know i think that there's a lot more that we need to see i think that florida uh would tell us and and billy napier sort of did that they still need to progress quite a bit with their offensive skill players uh, they're going to need more out of that wide receiver room. They're happy with what they got out of a guy in Shamira DK who's looked good in practices and is familiar with Graham Mertz, but it's it's new. And and even Napier said that is a group that will have to make some progress. Uh, I'm interested to see how the interior of Florida's offensive line shakes out. I think that they made upgrades at the tackle positions with Brandon Crenshaw-Dixon, uh, Devin Manuel, and then the return of, of Austin Barber and Cam Waits were kind of banged up. But the interior of the line is, is still interesting to me. We, at the moment, it looks like Najee Harris is going to take on that left guard role. Uh, Jake Slaughter is back to play center. Uh, and then Damian George moved from the outside to go play right guard. So how that group, that trio on the inside ends up panning out, are they able to protect Graham Mertz more than they did a year ago uh, and, and enable some more explosive offense uh, will be what I continue to look for. And, and have we seen it yet? It's too early to say. But, but I do think that, you know, the energy is different and better around Florida football right now. There's definitely the something to be said for, like, Graham Mertz banging on the table for DK, the relationship they have. Like, you can look at the numbers last year, and it's not awe-inspiring from DK. But go back two years ago, uh, I think he had 60-something receptions when Graham Mertz was throwing those passes. You're trying to find a replacement for Ricky Pearsall. There is not a one-to-one -one replacement, but you've got to get some attention away from Trey Wilson. Because if you don't have anything proven, um, as good as Trey Wilson is, defensive coordinators will figure a way to scheme him out of games and force Florida to go somewhere else. So you're going to have to find uh, options. But um, the the spring portal will be open again, uh, and we'll see if Florida looks to add anything else. But I think DK has looked good. Khalil Jackson will get more opportunities. Um, and, and there's certainly plenty of opportunities uh, for guys, unfortunate for me, big Andy Jean guy, South Florida guy. Um, he's been dealing with uh, hamstring issues and, and has been in a black jersey for most of spring. But Aiden Mizell, Andy Jean, um, and then the two freshmen. We still got to find out, Jacob, how a, a a man, the stature of Tank Hawkins, gets the nickname Tank. Uh, we need to do some Big J journalism yeah, to find out how one. someone 5'10", 165 earns the nickname Tank. No limit soldier. I don't know. Max. Well, that that uh, also the tank you gotta give tanks the credit that they deserve. Those things are that they can yeah. move and he can move. Yes. So yeah. uh it's uh I, I don't I don't know that it's a totally misfit nickname. I think uh, like what what scares me, like uh the last year we said the defensive line was, was was strong in spring and then also strong in fall camp, but then we realized that our offensive line was poo. So, like, with the off offense and Billy saying the receivers are going to have to step up, but let's also send the DBs that have looked a lot better, just, you know, gives me some caution a little bit. Uh, I do want to see us grab an outside receiver uh, so in the portal somewhere. Um, hopefully one of these guys like Andy Jean pick it up and, you know, get out of the injury uh, circle. 
But right now, that's my my cause for concern. Right now, it's outside receiver. I think Trey Wilson could play inside. I like DK to play inside of the slot as well. But right now, who who is that outside threat? I know Khalil Jackson has shown some promise out there, but I think we need a true number one on the outside um, to take some things up, up top to go deep. I, and I don't think it's crazy to say at this point, even though we're, what is it, Nick, five practices into spring ball now? Yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't think that it's crazy to say that that's going to be a priority for Florida in the spring window, or at least it has to be. Mm. I, you know, I, I think Florida will have to go out and see at a minimum what's available at the receiver position because it's not a, a terribly deep group with proven talent. And there are guys who are really good, or at least from a raw perspective, in this unit. You know, t- Tank is, is somebody who I think is really talented and, and could be a difference is that, you know, speedy gadget guy that we kind of saw Eugene Wilson do last year is Wilson graduates to a more uh, prominent, just regular go-to receiver type role. Uh, But they will need to go and find somebody, I think, in the portal to be able to bolster that unit with, A, talent, which matters, of course, but also experience. This is a young group outside of DK, and and, and I think that they would benefit uh, from somebody who is proven in terms of their production, but also proven in terms of, you know, leadership and experience uh, who could go in and elevate the unit from that aspect as well. And and it could be tight ends as well, like uh, Keon Zipperer. I mean, he had knee surgery over a year ago now um still in the black jersey not not participating does he get back what will he be will he stay at florida uh for his last year of eligibility arliss boardingham has to get better as a blocker i think he needs to continue to evolve as an all-around player but it doesn't have to be a uh necessarily you know a bolitnikoff wide receiver there are other options I, i like florida's running back room to take some pressure off um and you need a tight end to step up. I think I've said before, and Pete got people got mad that Hayden Hansen is Jonathan Odom with healthy knees. Mm. Um, but like you could go into the portal and get more talent at tight end or, or mm. a pass catcher at tight end. Yeah, with the current yeah. setup, you are essentially betting that Hayden Hansen is going to take a massive step forward as a pass blocker and and you know run blocker. You're taking a reasonably sized bet that. Arliss Boardingham is going to take a step in the right direction, as you just mentioned. I think that that group has what it needs from a receiving standpoint. I think Boardingham gives Florida something that it probably hasn't had in some years now at, at the tight end position, just as somebody who can line up in that Y position outside and go catch a pass. But they don't have the protection that they probably need from that group yet, at least not in a proven way at all. Uh, and so, you know, receiver, tight end are probably the – priority offensive positions for the spring portal period. And I will also add, and you know, I'm sure you guys will agree, the spring portal period is no sure thing. It's not mm. like the winter. The winter is an opportunity to go get proven dudes who are going to make a difference on your roster. And at least historically, we have not seen the spring win- window produce that same kind of talent. Ricky Pearsall is a spring transfer guy. He, he participated in spring practices with Arizona State and then jumped into the portal. Do I think that that is going to be the exception or the rule? Probably more the exception for that portal period. I think guys who are jumping in that late are either in a hairy coaching situation, which is exactly what Pearsall was in. That was the end of the Herm Edwards experiment at Arizona State. Is there a Herm Edwards, though, that's going to really motivate a lot of these guys to enter the portal? No. It kind of seems like a one-off type of situation. So I'll be interested to see the exact level of talent that enters the Mm -hmm. portal in addition to who Florida chooses to pursue based on its needs and and what it's able to get out of that. And and you can't, uh, there is no SEC to SEC transfer. So you're looking outside of the conference uh, in that spring portal period. We know how much this coaching staff uh, values their evaluations, um, which might not uh, lend itself to a 15 day window, uh, which uh, listen, the 15 day window is just to enter your name. Uh, but things do tend to move uh, more expeditiously in the spring than they do in the fall window, their winter window. They seem to move like the NFL free agency where there's no contact period. Then all of a sudden you have a four year, $50 million deal signed. Dan, I know you're not (laughs) suggesting that there's tampering uh, in college football. I know that's not something you would slander football with. (laughs) 
cool food came for more. We seem to have some people that have struggled with communication. Um, Jacob, want to get your thoughts. I know you mentioned Aaron Gates. Um, of the players that maybe we haven't seen much of, is Aaron Gates probably the guy that you're most excited about? I know Nick said he's also potentially on punt and kick return, but who are some other names that you're – I know you've mentioned a few, right, but but who are some other names that, that maybe people have forgotten about or you know, redshirted last year that you're, you're excited about? Yeah, I don't know that it's a name that people have forgotten about necessarily because it was a pretty high-profile moment in the offseason. But just with the injuries that are occurring at Florida's linebacker position, I'm personally excited to see what Grayson Pup Howard uh, is going to be able to do throughout the rest of the spring and you know into the summer. Uh, Shamar James is limited. Derek Wingo is limited. Uh, Miles Graham is out for the remainder of the spring after undergoing back surgery. So uh, Grayson Howard, who I already thought was going to be in a position to play a, a pretty prominent role, if not start, is now – one of just a couple guys who are even healthy. So uh, he will have to step up. And I, I do think that Florida was already prepared to, to lean on him. So it, I don't know that it, you know, fulfills the under the radar category, but certainly somebody who is uh, very important to this team at this point, uh, I'm trying to think, you know, under the radar, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say this, uh, Triquez Bridges, Florida's transfer from Oregon is going to be in a position, I think, to step in with the first team defense at safety didn't play a whole lot even last year at Oregon. So if you're going to go back and, and watch his film, I think he had like 16 tackles in his final season yeah. at the Ducks. And this year is going to be put in a position where I would imagine he is going to play a very high usage role, whether that's as a starter or as a very top reserve defensive back who kind of splits some time between star and safety, uh, both of which I think he's capable of playing. Uh, we still need to, to have more time to really see what he's going to look like. But I do think that he's starting to impress and, and is part of the reason why uh, Billy Napier singled out the secondary as a unit that's taken a step forward. Uh, so I would say him. And then on the offensive side, uh, you know, I'll, I'll actually give the nod to Nick's guy here. I'll say, I'll say that the Hayden Hansen arliss mm. uh duo has, has moved in the right direction. I think that Boardingham uh, has clearly focused on his blocking over the offseason. He seems to still be a focus. Uh, he told us when we interviewed him just a couple weeks ago that that is something that he knows he'll have to be better at in order to elevate his game uh, in his second season as a full-time player. And Hayden Hansen as well. Hayden Hansen was a solid but not very good blocker last year. He was not a very serviceable pass catcher. Uh, and Florida will look to kind of elevate him in both of those regards this year because I think that he'll be somebody who's relied upon pretty heavily, especially as we don't really know what to expect from Keon Zipper or mm -hmm. whether or not Florida's going to go into the portal and go get somebody. So those are my, uh, those are my under the radar and or really need to step up uh, lists through, through five practices. I got, I got one question for you. Uh, interested in the running back room, uh, free Trevor Etienne, even though he was free after like 45 minutes after a DUI, <laughs> but free, free that man. Uh, but the backup running backs, everybody behind Montreal Johnson, how are they looking? Jaden Ball looks like a grown ass man, six foot, 230 plus. Uh, he, he looks like he's ready to perform year one. Uh, Trey Young Webb showed some promise last year. What's what's the room looking like behind Trey Young Webb? Well, I would say that they, they have multiple grown ass I men freshmen in that room. Jaden Bott looks like uh, somebody who could be a contributor right away, and uh, Kanan Daniels looks equally ready to contribute. Those are two massive bodied, true freshman running backs who I think are going to be capable of making an impact. Uh, you mentioned Trey Young Webb. I was really impressed with Trey web last year and there just wasn't really room for him to get his shine obviously trevor Etienne and montel johnson were going to dominate the rep share but if you look through the stats trey on web paced them in yards per carry last season he paced the whole team uh and so i'll be interested to see what he looks like in a expanded capacity um my biggest concern though for that room which i do think is is one of the more solid ones on florida's team overall is who is going to step up as a pass catcher and who is going to step up as a pass protector uh, last year, we saw Trevor Etienne struggle quite a bit as a pass protector. Uh, Montreal Johnson was somebody who was solid in that capacity. They will need to take a step forward, I think, to really complete Florida's offense, especially as it pursues this uh, step forward as a deep shot taking team that's able to pass down the field. You got to be able to protect in order to be able to do that. And the running back room is a part of that picture. Uh, and then as pass catching goes, you know, I don't think that we've seen Florida utilize at least as effectively as it could. Uh, it's receiver, it's, it's running backs, excuse me, hands in the passing game. And Jane Baugh is somebody who I'll be looking at as a candidate 
to really step into that role. He has receiver experience. He's got good hands. He's quick twitch. Uh, and I do think that Florida will look to kind of expand his role as somebody who can go and catch a pass out of the backfield. We saw them have to do it last year with Eugene Wilson. Yeah, I'm sure you guys remember Florida often. We saw them slot Eugene Wilson in, in the running back alignment just to kind mm-hmm. of get a, a matchup, whether it was with a linebacker or a slot corner who had to make an adjustment and go cover the backfield. And it worked really well when, when they did go to that. I think that in a perfect world, though, Florida's able to accomplish that by using a running back in that role. And Jaden Baugh is somebody who I think uh, can probably do that right away. Uh, and, and maybe even Trayon Webb a little bit. I think we've seen some athleticism from Webb that would suggest that, you know, perhaps he could be a good route runner and, and somebody that Florida could rely on in its passing game. But, but overall, uh, definitely encouraged by that unit. And, you know, I've been telling people for a couple of weeks now, uh, if there's one position group that you can easily mitigate a big loss like that of Trevor Etienne, it's probably at running back uh, where you can recruit, you know, good players reasonably easily. And uh, Florida's certainly done that. So they, they have a stable of good backs for sure. Okay. Yeah, those two, the two freshmen, KD, Kane Daniels, um, and Jaden Ball, don't look like freshmen. But boys showed up looking, looking like grown men um, at, at the running back position. So it'll be interesting to me, Jacob. I don't think we know what will the splits be. Last year, I think it was so 50 50. And going into the season, everyone was telling fans that, like, listen, I don't care if you think Trevor Etienne's better, it's going to be 50 50. Now, without Trevor, um, is it 50 50 still? Is it 60 40 Montrell in the rest of the room? Is it 70 30? I think, um, talking to some of the coaches, they think Montrell is a guy who can get stronger throughout a game the more carries he gets. So, how much of the how much of a bell cow does Montrell become, or do you still try to make it, you know, a 40 40 20 split between Montrell, uh, Treyon, and then the two freshmen? You know, I have to imagine that Montrell Johnson is going to get a larger rep share than he did last year. I mean, the guy returned, was draft eligible this past offseason, uh, is somebody who I think, you know, I, I, the way I see it is this. Florida, Trevor Etienne moved on because he wasn't the starter. And Florida held on to Montrell Johnson, who effectively became the starter. And so do I think that Billy Napier is going to now split reps between Montrell Johnson, the guy who stuck with him, through and through this entire process uh, and not elevate his rep share in favor of giving carries to guys like Trayon Webb and uh, Kanan Daniels and Jaden Baugh. I don't think so. I think we do see, you know, a, a slight bump in Montreal Johnson's usage, especially for the reason you said he improves as the game goes on. Uh, but I also think that we see Florida go a lot deeper into its running back room. Last year was primarily Johnson, ETN, a huge gap, and then Trayon Webb. This year, mm. I think we see Johnson – Webb, Daniels, and Baugh all get into the mix in some capacity, whether it's Baugh on the field if they want to throw a pass to a running back or Johnson on the field because they're going to run the ball inside the tackles. Uh, you know, it, it's a situation where I think that we see a, a more uh, healthy split across players, but Johnson will certainly be the headliner of that group, and it'll be clear that he's number one. And maybe we're forgetting that too. Um, Tawan just brought him up. Um, Cam Carroll. Cam Carroll, I think, can catch the ball a little bit. Um, had a pretty devastating knee injury, so we missed him last year. Um, he's just vibing at practice right now, continuing to go through rehab. But maybe he's a guy who, uh, when we talked to him last year, I, you go back and look at the numbers, he's got some pass catching numbers to show. Uh, but somebody who, when we talked to, said that, you know, catching catching balls is, is a – priority for him and something he takes pride in so i agree with you though like i would like to see especially without a go-to receiver outside of uh, eugene wilson or at least a proven one um finding other ways to to get running backs involved to aid the passing game jazz unnecessary there i uh i'll add this you know i think with cam carroll there is a matter of kind of wait and see what the knee turns out to be like. Uh, he's not practicing right now in spring practices. He's, we've seen him in a black jersey, but it's not even like he, he's, he's not really working with his with his unit. Uh, like some of the guys who are in non-contact do. This is a guy who's still a, a ways off, I think, from making a full recovery with his knee. Uh, if he gets back to a point where he can contribute, absolutely, I think we'll see him. He's a, he's a big body running back, tough runner. Uh, like you guys said, he can catch a pass if he has to. Uh, but again, I, you know, that was a really bad 
knee injury that he suffered last preseason camp. And I, I think that the road to recovery is still uh, a, a long one. I, I don't know that he's at the end of that yet. So uh, do I think that he can contribute? Yes. Do I think that he is somebody that we can currently, you know, insert into this rotation that we're talking about? Not confidently. So I, I, mm. I think that's more of a wait and see. But yeah, no, it's a good point. Cam Carroll is another name who could certainly be a factor if he's healthy enough to do so. Switching subjects real quick, because I forgot, is Asa Turner on campus yet, or does he come after the spring? Yeah, yeah, he's on campus he, practicing. Yeah, yeah, he's much from he's him. I, I know he's still getting acclimated, but have we seen much from him, or yeah, you I know, I, I, I am not so sure. I, I, I think that there's a chance that he could be kind of a flex player between unit one and unit two. Uh, a healthy Jordan Castell is somebody who I think will almost yeah. certainly start for Florida. And then it's kind of a battle between a couple guys. They brought in DJ Douglas from Tulane, who was really good last year uh, and could easily be a starter. Uh, I mentioned Triquez Bridges earlier. I think that he's somebody who absolutely could be a starter in this defense. Uh, Aaron Gates can play a little bit of safety if he has to. Uh, and then there's a battle. You got Bryce Thornton, who's coming off a solid freshman season. He's back. Uh, you know, Asa Turner is somebody who I think could, could play a role. Uh, you also have to remember, Turner was not healthy throughout the entirety of last season and has had – some injury history, you know, at Washington. He is fully healthy right now, but will I uh, assume that he's the starter at this point in the game? No, not quite yet. Uh, but mm-hmm. I do think he's a part of that conversation to occupy the second spot that that isn't Jordan Castell's role. But, I mean, that's a huge part of what Florida has needed is that depth and that ability to have somebody step in when one of the starters does go down or needs rest or – you know, get banged up a little bit. So uh, it's good to see that some of these areas of concern have been addressed. Uh, Jacob, we've kept John for a long time. I really appreciate it today. Uh, Nick, Silk, any final questions before we wrap Jacob up here? No, Jacob, I'll see before, you tomorrow. before we put you in the uh, Christmas wrapping and put a bowl on you, um, DJ Lagway, man, how, how, mm. how, how impressive has he, has he been so far in spring? Yeah, I mean, the, the talent is super apparent. I, I don't think anybody would try and tell you that this isn't a guy who's super impressive and super skilled. Um, I think that it is important, though, that Florida fans tamper their expectations such that they understand that this is a true freshman playing the most difficult position to play in the most difficult conference to play it in. Uh, and so time will be required to get him to a point where he is – ready to go and, and contribute in this offense. He is QB2. Uh, Graham Mertz is going to be the starter, and if something were to happen, Lagway is the next man up. Uh, but I think that we still need to see Lagway acclimate a little bit it's a, to the college game, and it's not a knock on him in any way at all. This is more me saying that there is a true freshman quarterback, regardless of his talent or stars or pre-college ratings, who is on campus right now, and he will be a true freshman. He needs – to have the true freshman leniency and, and the opportunity to learn and get his feet under him. So I'm super impressed. Uh, but my one of my takeaways from the first five practices is that this is a super young quarterback. Uh, this is a guy who is going to absorb a lot from the mentorship that he has with Graham Mertz. Uh, Billy Napier is extremely excited to work with a guy who is supremely talented. I, you know, I think that there's few, if not none, uh, better quarterbacks in the country at his age than DJ Lagway. Uh, but I also will say this, time will be required. Uh, and we're going to see how that shakes out. I think that we see Lagway contribute in some capacity. I would imagine that we see packages for him in games. Is that a week one thing, though? I'm not sure yet. Uh, I think that that's going to be something that we see over the course of the remainder of the spring uh, and then even through the summer and preseason camp. But to say he's impressive would be an, un- an understatement. He is a five-star quarterback for a reason. Uh, the arm is incredible. He is an athlete who can, you know, tuck the ball and run in a way that I don't think Florida really has in Graham Mertz, mm-hmm. which adds a dimension to this offense. Uh, and he's an impressive player without question. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, exactly what the first year development is and, and what that turns into from a usage standpoint. Right. That arm talent is, is undeniable. That release is nuts, man. Hey, Jacob, keep killing it out there, man. I always see you on the timeline, breaking news, doing your thing, man. Big fan. I appreciate you guys. It's uh, It was fun joining you. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Jacob. We will talk with you soon. Don't be a stranger. See you Tuesday, Rudner.
Yes, sir. See you guys Tuesday. Appreciate you guys. Sounds like a wild, wild west like call out there. (laughs) (laughs) It'll either be a baseball or football, but uh, but we'll see each other somewhere. All right, guys. Well, Jacob, appreciate you. We appreciate you, brother. Jacob Rudner, two four seven. One of the hardest working guys in the business. Dude, I told him he um, he's covering basketball. I had I've only had to do it one year, um, but to cover basketball. Uh, especially the way he covers basketball, um, cover baseball.